Hello, welcome. My name's Stephen Dickens and I'm your host and you're joining us here on another episode of the Futurum Tech webcast. I'm joined with by Ryan Yako, formerly the CMO of Databand, now with IBM. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, man, what's going on? Good to, good to talk to you today. So we've been looking forward to recording this for a while. Maybe let's get the listeners and viewers orientated here first. Tell people a little bit about your role and then maybe also expand on the data band acquisition by IBM. I think that's still relatively fresh in people's minds. So maybe just drill down there as well for us. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for having me. So um, about a year ago or close up to a year ago, we had uh, IBM acquired data band. Uh, Databand.ai is what uh, the website was. And it's still probably going to be up for, for a while, but uh, we were a leader in data observability, specifically in the, the modern data stack space. And so uh, IBM obviously is a leader in, in data fabric and a lot of the things they're doing around governance, data integration, replication, uh, lineage, all those different areas of uh, establishing a data foundation. Observability just wasn't a part of their, their data stack. And so they saw uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, acquire data band and we've been a part of the data fabric team for uh, going on uh, about a year now. So it's been great because we were, we're able to really tap into different audiences that IBM mm -hmm. may have not had uh, communications with or may have not had an opportunity to discuss uh, solutions with, particularly uh, more code-based data engineering and data platform teams that are struggling with you know, pipelines breaking and data quality breaking, and they have no idea where the problem is. And uh, having data observability a part of their overall data engineering workflow has been a tremendous value add that we've seen. So that's a quick quick overview. And uh, I was I was CMO over there, um, and I'm leading uh, go to market strategy for IBM Data Band right now with uh, within the IBM Data Fabric. Fantastic. So let's dive straight in. You you in your introduction there, you covered data observability. Why is that becoming a hot trend? I hear a lot about it in the sort of data platform, kind of where customers are looking. You're obviously closer to it than I am. Why is that becoming such a hot trend and why are people starting to really engage with you and your team? Yeah, I think that there's there's been a couple, uh, I guess, macro things that have gone on in the space. I mean, one of them is the fact that data engineering teams and data platform teams are insanely just underwater constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we hear. Uh, we hear things like, Hey, we can't know, we, we can't be told, you know, a week from now or even an hour from now, if a data pipeline has failed, not know about it. We, we can't, you know, be blindsided by schema changes because then our people that are consuming the data downstream are going to have a problem. And so I think the way data observability has kind of come out is one is the fact of this uh, overloading of, of, of throughput that the data engineering team needs to really um, do at a high velocity clip and, and do it reliably is like, that's one of the problems that's, that's blowing things up. And then the second thing is there's so many different tool stacks that people are a part of nowadays. It's hard to keep track of all the different tools that are using open source, using something like Databricks or Snowflake or Airflow or DBT or whatever you're using out there is hodgepodge of just best of breed tooling that's out there. And if you don't have sensors and monitoring in place across all your different tool stack, you're going to run into a problem. And so I think those are the two main things, just the proliferation of the modern data stack and then just the overload of data engineering. So out of that really came a, a focus on well, how can we deliver value to this uh, Kind of underserved data engineering team out there with some some tooling, and if you look at kind of the way that application observability has gone over the past you know five to ten years with companies like Datadog and Instana and New Relic, everyone that's in the software space or a software engineer they have monitoring and observability tools already. Like that's already a, a table stake thing that they already have yeah. when they're actually monitoring their stuff in production. Data engineering teams don't have that. So if you take a lot of the core concepts that are a part of the software delivery teams and the software delivery engineering processes that go on there and apply that to applications and cloud infrastructure that's in prod, we're doing the same thing now for data engineering teams with data pipelines, data infrastructure, data, data sets, data tables. Uh, all those things are now a part of a observability for data engineering teams and not just for software engineering teams. So I think that's 
kind of the, the hodgepodge of things that have kind of gone on that's really made this uh, category take off. Yeah, it's interesting. We see that observability space, as you say, sort of primarily for the security and operations teams. It's interesting to see that now sort of bleeding across into that data space. I think the, the needs there are crucial. One of the things I wanted to sort of drill down on, as people, especially with AI, are starting to pull together what they're doing, one of the big areas we're seeing is data quality. Where does this play in from a data quality perspective? Yeah, there's a there's a, some pretty cool memes out there around uh, your AI strategy getting swatted down by uh, poor data quality, right? Um, so uh, you got to love a good meme to be able to describe this industry for sure. Oh yeah, I love I love them, and uh, they're all over Instagram and uh, LinkedIn. If you, you follow any of the data creators that are out there, so. Um, I think, I mean, it's 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 very you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, a thing that's been going on in the software delivery world forever. Like I used to work in uh, a company uh, called Tricentis that was around software test automation. We constantly talked about the need for testing and the right kind of testing at the right time and different layers of testing that you have so that you don't have a production issue when it goes out into the wild. Like it's 10 times more expensive, right? 100 times more expensive to, to fix something that's in production than if you had caught it earlier. Well, the same thing is going on in the data space, right? You have all this data being being passed through, data downtime, data bugs, data issues that, that occur so late in the process because there's not something there that can monitor things as it's in motion or at rest to alert and tell you the root cause of it to go fix it before it gets into production. So observability is really just another layer on top of your overall data quality strategy, data reliability strategy, and also data governance, right? So, I mean, we work very well with other data cataloging tools like uh, IBM uh, Knowledge Catalog is one of those. Other, you know, DQ solutions for testing. Uh, we work very well with other uh, other uh, built-in DIY monitoring tools that you have uh, as well as an extra layer on top of the data quality you're wanting to push out. So, um, like an example is, uh, you know, in AI, we have a customer that's using Airflow to trigger different SageMaker pipelines that are a part of their um, predictive models uh, for advertising. And so one of the things that they need to have is observability around the Airflow uh, processes and SageMaker pipelines in case anything goes bad, they need to go and correct those right away because the only way they're gonna know if something's, if something's wrong with the predictive model is if a pipeline is not you know, sending the right amount of data it's not sending it correctly. It's sending it at the wrong time or it's not even in, didn't even run at all. And so that's an example of like, you have a huge AI strategy going on on, on, on one hand, but all the data that's feeding that, all those models, if those go down, then there's a problem. Ryan, one of the things you mentioned, I want to take you back. You mentioned governance. I think that's a really key point. People are starting to think about kind of where is this data coming from? What's the provenance of that data? Maybe if you could just drill down on what that, what you mean, you, you sort of glossed over it really quick as part of the rest of the discussion. But I think it's something worthwhile coming back to. Can you just expand? Yeah, so from a data governance standpoint, that, that really entails a lot of things from data access, data privacy, to security, to um, making sure you have like certain quality scores around your data that are in a, in a resting motion. With observability, what we're doing is we're not taking away any of those things. Like when, when we talk about data quality, a lot of times we're talking about it in the midst of your overall data quality strategy. And a part of your data quality strategy needs to have something around the reliability of, let's say, data that's in motion. So I mentioned a lot of times the, the pipelines that are, that, are, that are feeding these data sets the schemas that are actually in motion within those pipelines, and then the impact analysis or lineage that actually tells you if this pipeline failed, then downstream there's another problem to, that, that could occur. And so when we talk about governance, we're not talking about replacing or uh, chipping away at the current uh, governance strategy you may have within your data. We're telling you, hey, this is a totally, totally separate thing that can add to your overall governance posture to make it even better. And so that's why we talk about when we go into talking about customers, they may have like a cataloging solution, but that may be only really geared towards data access and more geared towards uh, you know, correcting the data uh, as it's in like data tables and, and making automated corrections around that augmented data quality. 
we're talking about things that are even further up the stream before they even get to that point. So that's where I say it's a complementary. And we obviously the white paper we wrote uh, recently with Buterum kind of dives into that. And the reason why we did that is because um, uh, it's it's kind of annoying, but it, this is the way it is. Uh, if you look at across every observability solution that's out there, they're going to use language like data quality, data reliability, uh, uh, schema changes, pipeline issues, uh, data quality problems, data downtime. They're going to use a lot of the same terminology that traditional data quality tools already use because observability isn't something that's front of mind with a uh, VP or an executive, they know about data quality, but they don't know that data observability can lead to better, better data quality. And so um, we like to make the differentiation between, you know, this, this observability and data quality thing. It's not an if or, 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 and it's a both and it's, it's a both, it's a combination of things. And quite honestly, that's why you're seeing other, other companies out there that traditionally only talks about data quality now talking about observability because now observability has become a hot trigger item that uh, or term that people are now talking about. So there's a little bit of like uh, uh, keyword gamesmanship that's going on. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're all trying to add to your overall data quality, data governance posture. That's the, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. The market is always good at jumping on a new trend and trying to get to optimize for it. But I think to make this real for clients, can you maybe talk about, I mean, the technology is great, good to understand the data observability. We're hearing a lot about data fabric. Can you just expand on some of the use cases? So maybe let's take the technology and make it real. Where is this kind of being deployed and, and maybe talk about some of the use cases? Yeah, for sure. So within the overall data fabric, we we integrate to a lot of the, the current IBM solutions that you have, but our main integration point is to tie into the tools that are a part of an overall data fabric strategy that may not be the exact tooling that comes from one vendor. So for example, like one of the things a part of when we when we got acquired and we would talk to uh, the different account executives are a part of, you know, some obviously IBM has some of the largest companies in the world, right? And we come to find out that although they've deployed data fabric within these organizations, they have other teams and other departments that are using tools that are completely different than what IBM is 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 providing. So, for example, a major bank, you know, they were using IBM Data Stage for some of their uh, uh, workflow orchestration and data integration needs, but they had a whole other team that had around, you know, 5,000 airflow pipelines that they were that that they that they were deploying, but in a totally separate, several separate group. So that was an example where we could go in and say, hey, you know, are you, how, are you having problems with your airflow uh, DAGs blowing up? Are you having problems with you not seeing the visibility you want in a single pane of glass across all the airflow uh, pipelines that you have so you can know exactly when things go wrong or if schemas change within, the, within those data sets or there's pipeline latency, all those things, again, at scale, it's hard to, harder and harder to monitor. It was an easy way for us to go in and say, hey, we're not replacing Airflow. We're not replacing uh, uh, your Python scripts. We're not replacing uh, your DBT uh, uh, runs that you're using. All we're doing is we're adding a layer of insurance on top of these so that you can know exactly where the problems are when they occur and give you peace of mind so you're not having to manually you know, track these things. And so that's an easy way for, for DataBand to come into either existing or uh, new, new, new customers that are looking at you know, having more data quality within their, within their overall governance posture is just to say, we're not, we're not taking away anything that you have. We're just adding to it because all observability tools, uh, they are absolutely worthless unless you have it, tooling and processes already in place. Because all we're doing is monitoring those things and sitting on top of those things and giving you a, a better peace of mind of how those pipelines are running and, and, and tables are, are acting versus saying, hey, we're going to come in and replace all your airflow with a with a new orchestration tool that we're trying to sell you. Like that's not... That's not how our, our market is, our go to market is. So within the overall data fabric, we have kind of those two plays. We have the play of existing customers that are using, you know, full on IBM products. We can tie into those. And we have even the other, the, those same 
companies that say, hey, we're not using, we're using part of this, but we're actually using some of these other solutions over here. What do you, how do you integrate to that? And we can show them value uh, immediately now. So, so maybe help us quantify some of that value. What are customers seeing as they deploy data band? You know, what's the before and after picture look like? Is that people savings? Is it cost savings? Is it just data quality improvements? Or is it all of the above? Yeah, I'd say it's all of the above, but I'll give you some some examples. So I mean, we we measure we measure things in, in really like three different areas. One is mean time to detection, so mm -hmm. MTTD. And again, that's an example. That's a term that uh, application observability tools like Instana, Datadog, uh, New Relic, they use these terms as well because it's very similar. Like a lot, I keep saying that a lot of the, if you understand what observability is in the application space and it, a light bulb should trigger in your head and go, oh, we just need to apply that to our data processes and we'll see the same benefits as these application observability tools. So what is mean time to detection, which is how, how fast can we reduce the, uh, improve the time to you to detect something or even detect things you didn't even know about. And so one of the, when we set up a, a customer uh, on data band, we first get an inventory of all the different pipelines they have. We immediately set those up. We set baselines against those. So then we can do anomaly detection or on anything that looks weird outside of the normal instances of how that's baselined over you know a few weeks, a few days, and then it'll adjust based off of us using some anomaly detection. So that's one. The other one is mean time to resolution, which is MTTR. Again, another acronym that's used in observability space, which is, okay, we detected something, how fast can we resolve it? And that's really around the root cause analysis that we do in data. So that's telling you not just, hey, something broke, but it's, hey, this is why I broke. This is the problem that you're running into. This is how many times it's, it's, it's occurred. Here's a trend analysis of why this keeps occurring. Here's how it affects things downstream. All those things are help uh, helping you res figure out how to resolve that issue with everything kind of in one place, right? An example would be, hey, I had uh, some machine learning pipelines that were feeding a downstream DBT job possibly that then kicked off some tests and it ran and then it pushed some data into Snowflake. Well, we can track all of that end to end to show you exactly where the problems occurred, where the typical root cause is, and then helping you fix it. And then the last one is, really around, you know, if you detect earlier, resolve faster. The other one is you're, you're, end up, you're, end, you're going to end up delivering higher, uh, higher uh, data SLAs. So you're going to meet those and guarantee those data SLAs you have, both internal and external customers, or stakeholders rather that you may have. And so a lot of times these, these data engineering teams and platform teams, they have very, like, very clear, uh, service level agreements around when the data needs to get to a certain place at a certain time and the quality of that. Well, by adding in data band, you can it, more 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 likely guarantee those because anytime something breaches or is about to breach a data SLA that you, you've set up in our system, we'll tell you right away. And then hopefully as you learn more of the uh, nuances around what's been going on, how things continually break and you fix them more and more and more, then those processes get better and those data SLAs are met more and more. So we like to say a lot of times like data band is going to do a lot of a lot of alerting and um, cleanup for you initially when you first use it to say, OK, here are all the problems that we have in our pipelines and data sets. Let's fix those. Then you would hope that the, that alerting goes down and over time because we don't want to just add more and more and more and more alerts to you. Right. Hopefully it goes down over time, even and and, and it only grows as a proportion of to how much. Uh, uh, more workloads you put into the system, right? Then it uh, it becomes more of like a monitoring observability layer that hopefully should only go off when something really really bad happens, right? It's like it's 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 the engine light on your car. You don't want the engine light to constantly be going off, right? But if you've gone to the dealership and you fixed it, you would hope that the monitoring within the car is going to alert you when there really is a next problem. And by the way, you can't afford to then just take out an observability tool because you think everything's fixed. Because as we know, you ignore problems and you think everything is great, something happens and then it's a disaster. It's always the challenge. We talk about it in the observability alert fatigue. You've got to m map that right level of the right type of alerts and the right frequency of those alerts, but not over alerts because the team starts to switch off. Yeah. 
Well, Ryan, yeah. it's 2023. We're recording this podcast, and we've gone 20 minutes without mentioning AI. Oh, man. I know. It's, it's, like it's, it's in right now. I, I don't think that's yeah. entirely possible to record a podcast in 2023. Obviously, the data and the data pipelines and the data quality and the governance are all crucial as people start to think about their AI journey. What do you see as the implications? As I'm starting to think about, hey, I'm looking to deploy my enterprise AI platform, and I think that's where a lot of clients are, where do you see the data band piece fitting into that overall equation? Yeah, so we've got... So I, I mentioned in an example where we had a customer that was basically using AWS SageMaker for a lot of their ML pipelines and creation of their predictive models and things like that. We also obviously, uh, you know, this isn't news, but it's uh, a big deal, which is we, you know, IBM has relaunched Watch and the X as the enterprise edition for our overall AI strategy and that comes in three different kind of facets for the most part. It's a, it's dot AI, watsonx.ai, which is all about a studio around building and maintaining those models. You've got dot data, which is basically our open lake house to store the data and push the data to, uh, to these models. And we have governance dot governance, which is all around monitoring those models, monitoring the AI, figuring out if there's any biases or any issues uh, within those that can actually get uh, uh that could actually uh, be detrimental to your ai strategy right so all that's really awesome and then on top of that is again overall the the data fabric and so what i like to there's an analogy that i give and data man's a part of this analogy which is if you look at formula one formula one is a uh, very high stakes uh sport right it's it's you're driving a car hundreds of miles an hour uh, in very tight conditions, in very dangerous conditions. It, if anything goes wrong with the car or the operations or the driver or somebody somebody that's just racing against you, it could go it could go really bad. And but also it's one of the most exciting sports that's out there. And it's all about the constantly fine tuning of the car to make the car the be as better as good as it can be pre race, after race, and then even actually during the race with the different types of ways they can adjust the car mechanics. And so the way I like to describe it is in an overall AI strategy, if, if, if Formula One's the overall AI strategy, the car would be all of the uh, awesome things that Watson X does, right? It's all the, it's the steering wheel, it's the chassis, it's the driver, it's all the things that are actually building uh, uh, those AI models, right? And then, all the operations components that go into the car, the building of the car, the fuel injectors that go into the car, the team around the car, the radio notifications into the car to let the car know what, hey, you need to go faster, slower, take this turn, slow down, notifications around engine failures or things like that. All of those things are going to uh, cause, uh, are all going to come together for an overall AI strategy. So that's what I would say in terms of like the way these kind of two come together. And obviously, Data engineering team is at the forefront of that. They're the ones that are uh, pushing the data into these models so that they can be used for an AI uh, initiative that you may have. A Formula One analogy is always a good place to wrap up. Ryan, thank you for so much for joining us. Been really good to sort of drill into this. I think you mentioned it. We've written a research report here. Please click and subscribe. We'll put uh, the link to the report. But I think some fascinating points here, especially the AI piece that you talked about and where that's fitting in. So thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. You've been listening to another episode of the Futurum Tech webcast. Please click and subscribe and do all those things to help the algorithm. We'll put a link to the research that we've done with the Databank team at IBM down in the show notes, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.